Welcome to another episode of We Cook It right here on Lexan TV. Now today we are on location at the lovely Port Louis Marina and we want to say special thank you to Victory Bar Chef Randy. Today we are going to be featuring Mr. Timmy Peters. Timmy is the Senior Specialist of Wines at Brighton & Miners Limited and he's going to take us to school on understanding the basics of wines. It's going to be quite educational and exciting at the same time. You don't want to miss this episode right here of We Cook It. Welcome back. Well, for the special edition of We Cooking, you probably spot a couple, you know, bits and pieces on the table. It's not more about cooking today, but it's all about wines. And this segment is brought to you by the good folks at Brighton and Minus Limited. I have a gentleman with me. Let me tell you something. I don't think he likes me calling him a wine connoisseur. But hey, he is a specialist. I have joining me today to give us a little history lesson about wines is Mr. Timmy Peters. Now, Mr. Peters is the senior brand manager uh, specializing in wines at Brighton and Minus Limited. Timmy, how are you doing? Good, good. You're finally making yes, boy. Yes, yes, Long overdue, long overdue. Long overdue, and we're talking about my favorite beverage. Hello. <laughs> Grape juice in a bottle. Grape juice in a bottle. But a little now, more complex. Yes. Timmy, welcome to Lexan TV and thank you right. so much thank for, for joining us me. here. I want to say a special thank you before we move on even further to the management and staff of Victory Bar at Port Louis Marina. So Timmy, let us get down to business. Before we dive into all the nitty gritties about wine, you're going to take us to school today. It's about, you know, taste and flavor and the do's and the don'ts. I must ask you, why did you get involved in this specific field? Because I know this, it, <laughs> it, it doesn't just start here with you. I understand that you really truly have a passion for wines. What, what, what attracted you to this? Curiosity. Mm. So, going back to my early childhood days, um, you know, your parents would have that secret cupboard where they store their <laughs> liquor and their wines. And, you know, having had a grape for the first time and understanding that wines come from grapes, took a taste of the grape, it's sweet, and then I saw the wine in the cupboard, and I'm like, well, this has to taste good. <laughs> but of course, at that age, you're not allowed to drink. So, you know, when, when, when they're not around, I would open the cupboard, well, find the key first of all, and take a little capful. No, Timmy. So, the <laughs> wine in those days, it was ruby rich. Oh yeah, I remember that those. That sweet red <laughs> that they poured on the ham, they had in the black cake, yeah. and it tasted good. I'm like, wow, this is wine. It's sweet, it's palatable. Yeah. And then the curiosity just went on from there, and I remember there was a, a, a period in Grenada where Carl Rossi, I don't know if you guys remember yes. that wine in the big bottle, mm -hmm. the Burgundy, the Chablis, um, the blush that was out so that wine time happened then and you know I was even more fascinated with wines mm. the period changed as with everything else and then you, know, you jump into spirits and you forgot about wines and then I think it was 2005 or wow. six when whenever it was the Food Network came on television I know they would have some segments with Bobby Flay yes. when he's doing his backyard barbecue and he would, he would pair um, stuff with wines and do sangrias. Then the interest came back again. Fast forward three years, Moscato's on the scene. Sweet, sweet whites. And that's when I said, you know what? This is getting interesting. Yeah, and, and, then, and you went for it. The, the rest is history. The rest is history. Rest is and you're history. here today to give us a little bit of, you know, a little bit more knowledge. Listen, I know Grenadians love rum, but I know Grenadians love wines as well. So, firstly, when it comes to wines, Timmy, tell us firstly about the types of wines. I know we have red, we have, you hear white, you hear rosé. What are the basic differences? So, before we get into the colors, there are two types of wines. There's still wine and there's sparkling wine. So, you know, your sparklings are your Proseccos, your Champagne. Your still is what you find every day in restaurants, um, in your supermarket. Yes, there's a sparkling section. Um, Going down to the colors, you have white wines, you have rosés, and you have reds. 
Um, breaking down the whites, you have light whites and you have heavy whites. A lot of people didn't know that they are heavy whites. The heaviest white wine there is, is a uh, Chardonnay, right? It's, it's heavy oaked, it's actually aged in oak barrels mm. versus a Pinot Grigio, uh, an Alberino or a Sauvignon Blanc, which is not aged in a barrel. They're, they're done in, in uh, metallic vats. So it doesn't pick up any heavy flavor. If you look at a bottle of Chardonnay, it's darker versus the other whites. Because I'm looking at those right there in, yes. the, in the bucket and I can tell there's some sort of variances yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. And then you get into the roses, um, light, dry, crisp, perfect for hot weather, um, you know, easy to drink. And then there's a, a, a spin-off of roses. It's a Zinfandel, a white Zinfandel, right, which is sweet, appeals to the Caribbean palate. Just some quick history on white Zinfandel. It actually is from a Zinfandel grape, which they use to make a bold red wine. It's just when the wine is pressed, it's, it's uh, decanted right after. So it doesn't pick up a lot of the red color as it would in a, in a bold red wine. Mm. And then there's sparkling, yeah, fun there's time, sparkling. anytime, <laughs> all the time. Wow. Yeah. That, that, that's pretty interesting stuff. I, I, you have my cameraman like this. Ooh, <laughs> that's interesting. Now, let's talk about the flavors, you know, right. the, the taste. So, in my, in my early, early, very early uh, diving into wines, um, you know, you would read the label and you see things like hints of strawberry, chocolate, licorice. So, in my ignorance, I actually thought when making the wine while in the barrel, they would add these fruit or flavor enhancers to it, right. which is not the case. Ah. So imagine this. Let me give you a simple example. If I'm growing bananas in, let's say, Ladigue, and I'm growing bananas in the south of the island, the taste profile of the fruit will be totally different. One will pick up more of the flavor of what's in the soil if it's if it's acid, if it's sweet, um, uh, volcanic. So wow. the same thing applies to the flavors in wine. Now every grape has its own flavor profile locked into it that is released when the yeast is added to the barrel. Mm. That's where the flavors wow. come from, together with where it's planted and the soil composition and the climate. Wow. So you have cool climate, warm climate, hot climate. All of this brings out the flavor profiles in wines. Wow. That's it. Whoa. Nothing is added in the barrel. Wow. Yeah, because you know there's some without jumping in, I I, I know I've spotted little, you know, literature here and there yeah. also about spicy flavors. Spicy. And no, some of the spicy flavors are picked up in the barrel. So they use oak barrels, and you have barrels from France, Hungary, the US. So again, a tree growing in the forest, it will pick up the, the, the flavors from whatever is in the soil. I mean, if there's fruit around and it falls and it rots, wow. it gets into the soil. Right. This is how deep wow. wine making goes. Wow. They make the barrels and toast the barrels. So that actually brings out the flavor of the oak, so imagine the wine going in there, sitting for months, sometimes years. It extracts everything from nature. Wow. In that one bottle. In that one yep. bottle. Wow. And then there's the taste. You then got the sweet. Taste. You got dry. I have to confess I'm not exactly a fan of dry. And I'm not a fan of sweet. So what comes in between? <laughs> um, get me sick. <laughs> Ah. Demi sec, and um, I'm using that example from the sparkling side. So, just to get in really quickly with sparkling wines and understanding the labels on sparkling wines, there are four to five different definitions on a sparkling wine bottle. I actually got confused when I was doing one of my wine exams because you know you hear the name extra dry and you think it means extra dry. Yeah, it's actually the reverse. So there is, a, there is a sparkling chart that starts extra brute, which is as dry as it gets. You get the tingles here, mm. and then you have brute, which we see 
in the regular supermarket and most restaurants you go to. Right after that, we come down to extra dry. Mm. And then you have dry, then you have demi-sec, which is a bit of sweet, a little bit of dry, and then you have what they call cuvee or dulce, which is sweet. And the simple explanation is, one has more residual sugar in it than the other. Turn the back of the bottle and you will see the percentage. Extra dry has more residual sugar than brut. Oh. So it's not what the name says, extra dry. Don't ask me why they, they did it that way, but... So if I'm looking for my bottle of wine in the supermarket, I have to look for... Sparkling, that is. Mm -hmm. you, for you, mm -hmm. I, would, I, would, I would recommend... You can try a dry or a demi-sec. That will fit your taste profile. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. There must be some do's and don'ts when it comes to wines, Timmy. I mean, people probably don't even think about it, but if you can, give us a couple examples of what you can and cannot do when you're thinking about wines, whether it's storage, whether it's drinking, anything of it's that It's actually, sort. well, storage is a big thing. Yeah. Wine does not like heat, um, especially whites, because most of the whites are in clear bottles, so heat and sunlight will affect the wine. It will start another set of fermenting and it will it'll actually break it down and it'll taste like vinegar. Um, with your reds, you want uh, not a hot place or a cold place, but someplace cool. If you can get one of those racks to keep it at an angle, better yet. But you know, we have screw caps now for the reds. So you know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to, to go down that route uh, yeah. in having like a wine rack. And another thing too, when you open a bottle of wine, don't leave it in your fridge for weeks. Uh -huh. You know, depending on the wine, the red, the white, the rosé, if it's corked, if it's true cap, three, maybe five days. With cork, cork is a living organism and it allows air and aromas to come through. So imagine you, have, you open a really nice bottle of red, it's, it, it comes with a cork, you put it in the fridge, Three, four days after you open it, you're tasting onions. You're tasting what you have in the fridge, in the wine. Ah, yes, yeah, yes. bottle's no good. Yes. So storage is it's key when buying wines. I mean, don't buy a lot if you're not planning to drink it. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say for the record, it's not going to last five years <laughs> in my house. I'm just joking. I am in no way an alcoholic, folks. No, I'm not promoting that at all. Uh, that's fantastic. Now, tell us a few facts, you know, I bet you didn't know this or that about wine. I'm really excited to hear what you're coming with because I know you have a wealth of knowledge to me. Well, I bet you didn't <laughs> know that wine, Timmy will continue. <laughs> bet you didn't know that champagne is a blended wine. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that. Champagne is actually made from two to three grapes, uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Menure, and Chardonnay. Those grapes are grown in France to make champagne. And well, most people know this, but just to, for those of you who don't know, champagne can only be produced and called champagne in the Champagne region in France. Everything else is sparkling wine. And if you move over to Italy, it's the same. Prosecco, which is another sparkling wine, its origin is Italy. Wow. So that's all did you know about, about sparkling wine. That you didn't know. Now, if you, to me, I'm going to I'm gonna get a little, if you had to recommend uh, a favorite or based on, no, or even based <laughs> on your profession, you might have witnessed this. I mean, what do women tend to, you know, maybe lean a little more towards? Um, it depends on the mood, mm -hmm. the time of day. Um, but without those factors, a sweet rosé, a white, a white, a white Zinfandel, nice and cold. It's easy to drink, relaxing, hard day from work. You don't want, you don't want anything heavy. You don't want spirits. You just want an easy bottle that you can open and drink. A white Zinfandel. Most most women will go for a white Zinfandel, or a good Moscato, one that's not on the very sweet side. Maybe it has a bit of fizz in it or a sparkling moscato or sparkling rosé, either or. If yeah. you, Timmy, were to be named after a bottle of your favorite wine, sir, what wine would that be? I hope I'm not going to put your No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I would say I am a red blend. Really? Yes. I, I really do enjoy red blends because you get 
quite a few varietals in one bottle. So if you like Merlot, if you like Zinfandel, if you like Syrah, if you like Malbec and you like Cabernet Sauvignon, you get all of that in a big red blend, which has been around for a while. Um, red blends actually came on scene, I was say maybe six, seven years ago, um, out of California, some out of Australia, but red blends were actually going on centuries ago coming out of France, Bordeaux, which is the, you know, where Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot originated from. So the French, they've been blending wines for a very long time. Old world, old wine producing countries, the new world caught on later on. So yes, I'm a red blend. You're a red, I'm a red blend. blend. What would you say is the toughest thing? Now before we have a sip of something here, because I'm hoping that you would recommend something oh, that I would try. Definitely. But what, what would you say was the toughest part of your experience getting to understand the, the history of wine, the science behind wine, and everything else that came with it? I think one of the hardest things, it was learning the regions, um, what grapes are grown in the region, um, and learning the, 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 the taste and smell profiles. Now, you, you have a glass of wine, you smell, you know that scent, but you just can't remember what it is. So learning and developing my, my scent encyclopedia, like, like, like I would call it, that was hard, you know, just, just getting everything down and the regions, yeah. That, that part, it's always a learning process. You will smell something different True. than I will smell, but it's not wrong. Yeah. It's not. It's just, it's just what you identify that smell to be. It reminds me of a film I saw on Netflix. I bet you saw that film. The bad thing is I cannot remember the name, but it was, you know, essentially it was this young man who just wanted to follow his own dream and passion, um, trying to find the right career choice, fell in love with, you know, just understanding why. Would it be sour grapes by any chance? Probably, I can't. It, the name just includes me. No, I cannot remember, but I have a feeling that you've watched that about oh, five yes. times. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am a... Uh, everything on Netflix wine-related, I love to look at it. I mean, there's a, there's a program called Some. Some? Yes, you should check that out. I mean, mm -hmm. these guys study for the coveted Master Sommelier um, program and if you think I know wines these guys are wine gods <laughs> they can you can blind pour a bottle a glass of wine for them and they can tell you where it's from the type of soil the vintage wow. the year without seeing the bottle but I mean this is living yeah. eating breathing, breathing wine when you wake till you go to bed yeah, and it's a true. lot of studying but it's a coveted title and wow. there are not many some. persons. I'm Master good. some. Yeah. Master some. I'm, yeah, gonna that's, look, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna look that up. So, what would you recommend, sir? What do you feel like? <laughs> do, you, do you want something sweet? You want something with some vanilla notes? Vanilla sounds good. All right. <laughs> so I would recommend. Yes. A California Chardonnay. Yes. Lightly oaked. Canyon Road. Mm -hmm. Screw cap. Screw cap. One. See, now that's the next thing. You've probably seen that there are many different types and shapes of wine glasses. Tall, short, fat, skinny. Although there are almost countless shapes, the idea behind each is exactly the same. So you really don't need a different glass for each varietal of wine. However, knowing a bit about which wine works best in each glass could help you get the most out of every bottle. All good wine glasses should have a tulip shape with a base wider than the rim. This allows the wine to aerate and for the aromas to collect in the glass. When it comes to which shape of glass to use, you only need to remember a few. For champagne and sparkling wine, a slightly wider glass is often better than the flute. Using a wider glass allows aromas and tastes to fully reveal themselves. For white wine and rosé, a slim glass is perfect. However, more delicate and aromatic whites can be served in a wider glass. For light-bodied reds like Pinot Noir, a wide bowl helps you appreciate the delicate aromas. With full-bodied reds, a large, sturdy glass enhances bolder varieties like Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon. And for sweet wines, it's perfect to use a smaller bowl glass as they are usually served in smaller quantities. 
Different glasses can definitely help you maximise great wines, but it's most important to enjoy what you're drinking, no matter what. Next time you open a bottle of wine, try smelling and tasting out of different glasses to see if you can tell the difference. Folks, there's lots more to come with this speech, I can promise you that. So you see the colour, yep. the hue? Yeah. It's a golden colour. Very nice. Versus the other whites, like your Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay, mm -hmm. and, and Sauvignon Blanc, sorry, which is lighter in colour, it's, it's yeah. green. This, fantastic wine. Cheers. Cheers, folks. We're here at Victory Bar. We'll be right back after this. Cheers. I have been bracing for this moment, and just to let the viewers know again, I mean, who would have thought of pairing fried chicken yeah. with wine? Well, like I tell you, it's going to be quite interesting and exciting. Well, there you have it. Hope you learned a little bit more about wines after today's episode. Don't forget, you can check out Timmy Peters and the Wine Club on Instagram. Thank you so much to the team. Thank you for Brighton and Miners. And of course, special thank you to Chef Randy and the management and staff right here at Victory Bar. You should visit them sometime and have some downtime. Until next time, don't forget to click subscribe on our YouTube channel, to click share and like on our Facebook page as well. We'll see you next time. It's Lexan TV where it's all about life. Take care. Bye-bye.